Now, hi folks, today I wanna to look at the energy stored in a parallel plate capacitor, and I'm gonna do it three different ways. Pick the way you like the best. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so I wanna start off with parallel plates. I'm gonna assume there's a little bit of charge on one plate, plus QI and negative QI on the other plate. At this instant in time, there's going to be a potential difference between the plates, and it's going to be delta VI. Okay, I now wanna consider the work done by the battery, and I wanna transfer a little bit more charge on the plates. And let's just consider transferring some positive charge on the plates. Okay, uh, and then let's just assume that this number here is gonna be a small number. Now the potential difference between the plates, delta VI, this comes from our capacitance equation. Remember, it's proportional to the charge on the plates at that instant divided by the capacitance. Okay, So now the potential energy, if I'm transferring this amount of charge, this small amount of charge, delta QI, across a potential difference of delta VI, I know that the amount of work done by the battery in this particular case, let's call it delta U, is simply gonna be the amount of charge that I transfer multiplied by, and again, let's just assume that the voltage is more or less constant during this transfer, delta VI. Now, if you substitute our expression here for the difference of potential at this instant, I'm gonna get QI divided by C. So what does this look like on a graph? Right? If you were gonna plot the voltage on the plates at that particular time, and the amount of charge on the plate QI. Again, what I'm doing here is I'm transferring a little bit of charge. This is the amount of charge here that I'm transferring, delta QI. And at that instant, I had some potential difference between the plates delta VI. Now, as I transfer that much, this number here increases, okay? And the total energy transfer at any instant is simply the area under the curve. But really what I wanna know now is the total energy. And the total energy is I need to sum up the contribution due to all of these transfers, right? Once I've put more and more charge on the plates, the potential difference between them increases. So the amount of work that the battery does increases. At the beginning, to transfer the first little bit of charge, it's very, very easy, because there's no other charge on the plates. The battery does very little work. And at the end of the day, if I've charged this capacitor to have some total charge Q and some total potential difference between the plates equal to V, the area under the curve of this entire graph here, this is going to be equal to the work done by the battery. Okay. So the work done by the battery is going to be equal to the change in total potential energy. And all you need to do here is add all of those contributions here. And that simply represents the area under the curve of our graph. Okay. So that's pretty simple. The area under the curve is simply half of V, again, and that represents the difference of potential between the two plates and the total charge on the plates. Okay. And often, if you didn't start with any potential energy, or say this is the final potential energy stored in a capacitor, you can also write this equation uh, using different flavors. Remember our capacitor equation? Capacitor equation said Q equals to CV. If I want to rewrite the potential energy, I can rewrite in three different forms. If you call this form number one, form number two, I may choose to eliminate the, uh, the voltage. And I could do that again using the capacitor equation. Uh, if I do that, I can write the potential energy as one half. If I eliminate the voltage and replace it by charge, I'm gonna get Q squared over the capacitance. And the third method would simply be, what if I wanna eliminate the charge and just write the total potential energy stored in terms of the voltage and the capacitance 
again, this is pretty straightforward, 1 half CV squared. So there are three kind of formulas straightforward to calculate the potential energy stored in a capacitor that has a charge. Total Q on the plates and the potential difference at the end of the day is, is V. Okay, so that's method number one. Let's look at a different way to calculate the same thing. Okay, so for method two, I'm gonna start by considering a positively charged plate. It's gonna have some charge density on it. Remember, sigma, the charge density, is the total charge on the plate divided by the area. You should remember that positively charged objects, and if it's a parallel plate that's big and I'm close to the plate, will produce a uniform electric field that points away from it. Uh, the magnitude of this field is one half sigma over epsilon zero, because I have a single plate. Now I wanna consider the situation where I'm, oh, let's try that again. I wanna consider the case now where I start with this positive plate and I'm gonna place a negative plate just above it, almost basically touching it. It's gonna have some charge on it, minus sigma. At the end of the day, what do I wanna do? Is I wanna produce a capacitor. So and a capacitor at the end is gonna to have to have a positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate. And they're gonna to have to be separated by some distance. So how do I create this parallel plate capacitor? I had to go to the negatively charged plate and I had to apply a force in order to create the separation between the plates. However, if you look at all the forces acting on this negative plate, so there's gonna be my force that I'm applying, and there's also a force, there's an electrical force between the plates, right? And if you're looking at all the forces on the negative, negatively charged plate, this is what the free body diagram looks like. So let's consider uh, the work done by my applied force. Uh, before doing that, I could say that the, I know something about this electrical force because I know the charge on the plate. The charge on the plate is the area multiplied by the charge density. And the electric field is the electric field produced by the other plate. I know that too. That's this guy over here. That's E. All right, so what's the work? Let's calculate the work done by this applied force. So it's the magnitude of the applied force it's the magnitude of the displacement times cos of the angle between the force and the displacement. Now this guy we don't have to worry about. Since the force is acting up, the displacement is gonna be up. The angle between them is zero degrees. Cos of zero is equal to one. All right, at the end, and again, I'm able to use this equation here for the work because the force is constant. And the force is constant because the electric field produced by this plate is constant. All right, so let's substitute our expression. So Fa can be equal to Fe if I'm doing this at constant speed. So we have the area of the plate times sigma times the field multiplied by the distance between the plates. I could take this expression one step further by substituting the magnitude of the electric field so we still have our charge that I'm moving. The magnitude of the field now is one half sigma over epsilon zero times the distance d. All right, so let's clean this up a little bit. Let's put the one half in the front. Let's group some of the terms. We have two sigmas, so sigma squared. We have area, we have distance and divided by epsilon zero. This is the work done by my applied force. And at the end of the day, if you do work on a system, this is the amount of potential energy you've stored in the system. Now this doesn't look like the previous expression, does it? It looks significantly different because now I have it in terms of different properties. Remember what we had before. On the previous slide, I had one half QV. However, I can take this a step further, right? 
the amount of charge that you have on the plate, you can write as sigma times A. And the potential difference, I can write that as the field times the distance. Now it starts looking very, very similar to what I, what I have right here. Take this one more step further by substituting what is the magnitude of the field now between the plates. Now careful, this here is not the same as, this here is the field between the plates. When I derived this expression for the work, this was the field produced by one plate, and that was producing this electrical force between them. All right, so if you take this one step further, sigma A, the field between the plates is twice that value. It's simply sigma divided by epsilon zero, multiplied by the distance between the plates. Anyway, you can see now that uh, our expression boils down to what we just calculated for method. Two. Okay, and the final method, let's call it method three, you want to calculate the amount of energy stored in a system. One way to consider it is look at the energy stored uh, in an electric field. So again, we're going to consider one charge as positively, or one plate is positively charged, the other one is negatively charged. Uh, the energy density is often written by lowercase u. So this is the total energy per unit volume. Uh, it's given by this expression if you look in most physics textbooks. Okay, so really what I'm looking for in my expression here is what is the total energy stored in this system? And you can see it's, I need to know the electric field, right? If I know the electric field everywhere in space, I can calculate what the total energy stored in that electric field is. For a parallel plate capacitor, it's pretty simple because the field over here, in this region is zero. If I have two plates, the field out here is zero and I only have an electric field within the plates, which points from positive to negative, but the magnitude of the field is simply sigma over epsilon zero. So if you wanted to find the total potential energy stored in this electric field, since we have a constant field, it becomes very simple for a parallel plate capacitor. That's our expression. And again, we have one half, epsilon zero, the electric field is sigma, oops, sorry, let's try that again. Erase that, is sigma over epsilon zero. Don't forget to square it. And now what is the volume? Again, I have to integrate over the volume where the electric field is. That's this entire volume, the volume occupied between the parallel plates of this capacitor. So again, if our parallel plates have an area A, and the distance between the plates is D, the region where I have this electric field is gonna have a total volume simply equal to the area of the plate times the displacement. You can see we have a lot of the same <laughs> letters uh, from the previous slide. Okay, so we're gonna have one half here. One of these epsilon zeros is gonna cancel. So at the end, I'll be left with epsilon zero in the denominator, sigma squared, a times D. Again, this is the exact same expression I had on the previous slide. And just a kind of a different way of calculating it using our energy density. Energy stored in an electric field is given by this expression here. Again, if I want to find the total energy, I need to integrate the electric field over the entire volume. It's very simple to do for parallel plates. It's a little bit more complicated to do if I have a capacitor with say concentric spheres, or I have one plate that has positive charge, the other plate has negative charge, because here the electric field, although the sketch is simple, it varies, right? It's stronger when you're closer to the positive plate and gets weaker as I go toward the negative plate. So this integral becomes a little bit more complicated. All right, well, that's it, folks. Uh, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions, just leave a comment.